America is an extremely diverse country, and there are many lenses through which you can view it from. America has never been a homogenous country, and each of the various cultures that have entered into it have brought their own histories and perspectives. I'm currently writing a civilizational history of America that tries to explain how America developed, what makes America different from other countries, and where we're going as a society. One of the major things to grapple with is the massive ethnic diversity with which Americans often have trouble understanding. Americans, in some ways, both underplay and overplay their diversity, which often confuses foreigners who don't know what to think. In this video, I'm going to take 10 different sub-ethnic groups of Americans across American history. Starting before Columbus and ending today, by looking at their journeys as cultures, we will try to tease out how America works as a society on a broader level. America's diversity is one of its greatest strengths, but it does come with some pretty serious historical baggage. In the Magellan series Ku Klux Klan and American Story, you can see how some of this history is really dark. Ku Klux Klan and American Story covers the KKK's evolution from a group of disgruntled Confederate veterans to a national movement that continues to operate even today. The series does a great job of showing the resistance to change and how America is still haunted by its legacy of slavery and discrimination. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service made by filmmakers with the best selection of historical documentaries and movies out there. They have content covering everything from the ancient world to current events and from true crime to astronomy. Magellan's compatible with just about any device and is 4K with no additional cost. It's a great platform for an affordable price. I absolutely love Magellan and all the historical, scientific, and cultural documentaries they offer. Magellan is something for everyone, and for my audience who uses the link in the description, they're giving out a one-month free trial, so go to Magellan TV, set up an account today, and learn about whatever fascinates you. Number 1. The Native Americans The Native Americans came to America as part of a broad array of various groups and races that I've talked about in this video, but includes the ancestors of the modern Australian Aboriginals, Polynesians, Europeans, Mongols, the indigenous inhabitants of Japan called the Ainu and Siberians. They came over to America both by boat and walking during the last Ice Age, and mixed together to form the modern Native Americans. Largely due to the lack of easily domesticable plants and animals, the Americas were thousands of years behind the Old World. When Europeans arrived, the Native peoples in the modern United States didn't have metal working the wheel or writing. The modern United States was divided on a line going southwest to northeast from Arizona to Quebec, the east of which there was agriculture and to the west of which it was hunter-gatherers. In the modern world, partially since there are so few natives left, modern America treats the Native Americans like they'd like them to have been, rather than who they really were. And for both the right and the left, that is basically the image of them being uncivilized hippies. The less philosophic view of the world is underwritten by the need to have a noble savage, and the right by the need to demonstrate the superiority of Western civilization. Both of which means the natives get stuck between them. However, the real natives defy both views. The Native Americans were in real terms like most other cultures around the world, with all the flaws and strengths that the human condition brings. Many natives were pretty advanced. The American Southeast had massive cities like Cahokia and modern Illinois across the river from St. Louis, which was larger than London during the Middle Ages. When the Spanish arrived in the Southeast, they saw developed states with large villages that bordered upon cities, governmental structures, and armies numbering in the thousands. The natives actually defeated the first group of Spaniards that entered the region. I think a pretty telling example of all of this is that the giant forests the Europeans saw upon entering the region were actually tended by the natives, who would burn and cultivate these forests to be as productive as possible. European visitors describe them looking like the manicured parks they'd see back in Europe. At the same time, the societies in the eastern United States were the place in the world where women had the most rights and power. However, the flip side to this is that the natives weren't angels. Warfare was endemic, with it often being normal that 20% of young men would die in war, far above rates in Europe. Just like how Eurasian states would fight off barbarians, we see barbarian invasions of civilized societies as a norm in the Americas. Also, just look at the Iroquois tribe who committed literal genocide against the whole Midwest from the Appalachians to the Mississippi River, killing all the local peoples in order to sell their beaver pelts to the Europeans. In many native cultures, the amount of honor someone took was based off how long they could torture their opponents for. Captives would normally have their bones broken and skin ripped off, and afterwards their hearts eaten in order to take their strength. Which brings me to the frontier period, where the Indian Wars should really be viewed as a horrifying post-apocalyptic tribal war. 
First of all, the reason that the natives were wiped out so easily is that over 90% of their population was killed by European diseases. Something a lot of people failed to understand is that the elites, whether the British or on the East Coast, often had a lot of sympathy with the natives, but there was very little centralized power in the frontier, and it really should be viewed as a tribal war, in which various sides would commit atrocities against the other, which would just fire up the other side, and then it would be a cascading effect. For example, I have at least five ancestors who died in the Indian Wars, and the whites took full revenge for any atrocities the natives committed. These often weren't easy wars either. The longest war the U.S. fought in its history wasn't in Afghanistan or Iraq, but against the seminal natives of Florida. Tecumseh was a veritable prophet-slash-messiah who was able to unify all the native tribes between the Gulf Coast and Canada against the white Americans only to be crushed in the War of 1812. If you compare Indian relations in America versus Canada, it makes the U.S. look very bad, where the colonization of Canada, and New Zealand also as well, was almost entirely peaceful while the U.S.'s was marked by breaking treaties driving allied Indian peoples off their land, wars of genocide and the like. When the anger wore off, the natives were living on terrible land the whites didn't want. A really horrible story is the Trail of Tears, where the U.S. forcibly drove the natives from the southeast to Oklahoma. The terrible thing is that these were native peoples who were actually on good terms with America, and it integrated into capitalism and Western society. The Americans forced them to march over 700 miles west, only to take their lands in Oklahoma 50 years later. The story of the natives and the reservations is a mixed story. It combines ingenuity and wealth with stuff like the casinos, but at the same time, many of these reservations, which effectively act as independent countries, are really third world places. Native cultures gained a massive resurgence over the 20th and 21st centuries, and I think a great irony is that the number of people who identify as Native American has gone through the roof, mostly due to white people with infinitesimal small amounts of native blood, identifying as native. However, the number of genetically native people is collapsing, as Native Americans have the lowest birth rate of any group in America, far below replacement rate, so much so that there might not even be natives at the end of the century. There's a sort of sad poetry to the native peoples. They went from controlling a whole continent to being strangers in their own nation, not even 2% of the population, in all less than a century. I would have expected at least one of America's states to be predominantly native, but no, the whites wouldn't even let them keep Oklahoma. Number 2. English Americans You know how vanilla ice cream is statistically by far the most popular flavor of ice cream, but no one says their favorite flavor is vanilla? Or calling someone vanilla is a way of saying boring, but we all eat way more vanilla than any other flavor? That's the story of English Americans today. On the U.S. Census survey, English Americans are around 7% of the population, but analyses of anything objective, whether genetics, compiling data from older censuses, or last name analyses, show that Americans of English descent are by far the largest ethnic group in America. Americans tend to view their ancestry through who their last ancestor they remember coming over was. In our days of diversity, people tend to only pay attention to things that are spicy and different from the baseline. About five times I've told people I'm of mostly English and Irish ancestry, and the person would reply back, sometimes even in the same conversation, you're of mostly Scottish and Irish ancestry, right? Subconsciously substituting English out. The English Americans became so large due to centuries of massive birth rates. In New England, for example, the average family would have 10 children in the colonial era, almost all of who would survive into adulthood and have another 10 children. For a comparison of how much that compounds, 12% of Americans are of Mayflower descent, or a famous boat that came over in the 17th century with 200 people. 12% of Americans is more people than there are in the country of Poland, and the same amount as there are black people in America. Since World War II, the dominant trend in American history writing has been to overplay the importance of ethnic diversity and underplay the importance of regional diversity. But realistically, English Americans are overwhelmingly important to the nation's history. The vast majority of our leading figures in almost every field across our history, whether politics, military, science, literature, or business, were of English ancestry. Practically every major institution of America dates back to an English president, whether government, personal freedoms, economic system, religion, military structure, and the list goes on. I mean, culture is incredibly important for how societies develop, and it's not a coincidence that nations with similar cultures like the Anglosphere, but very different geographies, end up with similar economic conditions. And so, the English created the fundamental core of American society. Three major groups of English Americans came over during the colonial era, creating the cultural framework that became America. 
The first were Puritans who came from Eastern England to New England. They were effectively a religious cult that demanded extremely strict rules and standards of conduct out of their followers. The flip side to this was that their society was extremely wealthy, creative, and functional. The second group of Englishmen were cavaliers from the south of England, or the second sons of nobility and their peasants who created the culture of the American South. This was a more rowdy and fun, but also less creative and fair society than New England. And the third group were Quakers from the north of England, who came to Pennsylvania and established an anarcho-capitalist state that became the basis for the stereotypically middle American culture of being hardworking, friendly, not trusting government, and minding your own goddamn business. All of these cultures spread west as America did, creating their own genetic clusters that are still evident today, and creating the eternal American divide between North, Middle, and South. In this, the North and South are permanently at odds on every issue from slavery to gay marriage, with the Middle deciding who's going to win. An important final note is that wasps or white Anglo-Saxon Protestants have a reputation for being wealthy in the status quo, but that's really not the case anymore. Your average English American is poorer than your average white American, and wasps are actually underrepresented in elite positions, probably due to their overrepresentation in rural areas. For every Bartlett you find in the Hamptons or Wall Street, you have a Todd in Beatonsville or a Jack in Montgomery, Alabama. Number three, African Americans. God, I feel like I could literally say anything here and it would be construed as offensive by one of the political extremes. However, I'm just going to try to do my best to search for the truth and hope that works. African Americans came over to America largely so the Southern elite could replicate nobility back in Europe, while white Americans were unwilling to be their peasants. America was peripheral to the Atlantic slave trade since it didn't make sugar, which was the big moneymaker of the time. Thus, America got a lot of the most stubborn and free-thinking slaves from the Igbo and Yoruba peoples of modern Nigeria, who populated the northern south, while meanwhile the southern south was largely people from the Congo and Angola. The ancestors of most of modern-day African Americans came over in a 40-year period from 1700 to 1740. American slavery, when compared to the rest of the world at the time, was a weird combination of really bad and less bad. Since America was majority white, slaves had less social mobility, independence, or dignity than other slave societies in the Americas because if a black person had any degree of social upward mobility, they'd just say, why doesn't a white man do that job? Slaves were forbidden from learning how to read, keeping families, normally operating on the market, and many states forbade or made it very difficult for masters to free slaves. However, since America had such a high standard of living in general, American slaves had better standards of living and quality of life than slaves in other areas of the Americas, and even than many peasantries in European countries like Ireland or Ukraine. Black American culture was created by white America to strip them of any ability to resist and dehumanize them. They were forced to renounce their African names, religion, and languages that could have given them an identity. They were removed from their families, prevented from gaining any tradable skills or education. If there's any historic equivalent to being raised by an abusive, alcoholic, narcissistic parent, it's this. Black Americans became symbols and scapegoats for the white Southern society. There was mass hysteria about black men sleeping with white women, while at the same time white men were raping black women at such a rate that a quarter of the African American genomes of European origin. At the same time, there was a good deal of cultural mixing between white and black culture, even during the colonial period. Remember, during slavery, white and black Americans lived in extremely intimate conditions, often as lovers, friends, co-workers, nannies, and the like. White American food, religion, architecture, and music were all influenced by African forms. A great irony is that the Ku Klux Klan might have been based off an African precedent, since very similar organizations exist in West Africa. With the end of slavery, you saw a retrenchment of white supremacy in the South for another 100 years in which blacks were prevented from voting and often had any real attempts at leadership or success result in lynching or vigilante hangings. However, this legal discrimination was brought to an end by the remarkable and admirable movement by Martin Luther King to gain legal equality. A hundred years ago, almost all blacks lived in the South, and especially an area of the Deep South called the Black Belt. But during the World Wars, you saw a massive black migration to major cities in the North and California. Interestingly enough, you see a cultural process identical to what was happening in Africa at the very same time called Anomi. Before the 1960s, black Americans had higher marriage and lower drug usage rates than the white community, and significantly lower crime rates than afterwards, as well as being a community that, when polled, had massive interest in education. 
However, some shifts that I don't fully understand occurred in the 1960s that resulted in an epidemic of crime, family breakdowns, lower educational interest, and drug usage in the black community. For some perspective, black people commit five times the per capita murder rate of white people, while there's a 26-point gap in educational achievement. In general, black America thrived through individuals and decayed as a collective. Black people are incredibly overrepresented in pop culture and have gained worldwide fame. Black America has been vital to every element of American culture, however, especially so in music, where black people effectively created the genres of rap, rock, soul, gospel, jazz, funk, among others, even influencing mostly white genres like country. This is an immense credit to the black community and remarkably impressive. It's crazy to see wealthy suburban kids try to act like gangsters, and I just think, you know those gangsters would be happy to switch lives with you? I was watching a music video from the Uyghur Justin Bieber, Ablajan, and he had a black American to give him street cred and rep him up, which is amazing for an area of the world 7,000 miles away from the black belt. At the same time, the income gap between black and white people has grown, and a huge percentage of the black community lives in degrading poverty. We know this income gap largely isn't caused by discrimination, given that Nigerian Americans have higher incomes than white Americans, and black people whose ancestors are immigrants from the West Indies, or whose ancestors were free before the Civil War, are significantly wealthier than the rest of the black community. Studies found that there's no IQ or educational gap between black and white children of American military members raised abroad, but cultural and social factors in America create said differences. I'm going to get my controversial opinion out now, but I don't I don't think the current emphasis and direction that the black community gets preached at by social justice is healthy. Imagine just as an example if you were a psychologist or friends with the metaphorical black community which was coming out of centuries of oppression and trauma. You would never tell it to build its entire identity around victimhood and say that there's nothing it can do and try to get concessions from the rest of society. You would try to find a way to come to terms with the awful things that had happened and do what was right going forward. For example, I think the glorification of rap culture and the idea that education is seen as playing the white man's game in a lot of modern black culture is extremely counterproductive and unhealthy for the whole black society. I have total sympathy for the black community, and trusting the rest of America after everything that's happened would be extremely difficult. However, I don't see why the modern wokes aren't just another brand of white elites who are trying to use black people for their own gain. Number 4. Scottish Americans Scottish Americans are one of the most silent and little known, but also incredibly influential groups in America. Most people of this demographic, when asked what their ethnicity is, just say American. Before we start, there are two main regions of Scotland that have cultures so different they basically boil down to different countries. The first is the flat English-speaking lowlands, and the second is the mountainous Gaelic-speaking highlands. Most Scottish Americans are lowlanders, and even people from the English side of the border who share a very similar culture. This area was overpopulated in the 18th century, and so many moved to Northern Ireland, becoming a majority there only to find more poverty and repression by English landlords. And then this group, which has become known as the Scots-Irish, immigrated to America in the middle of the 18th century. They settled the Appalachian Mountains, or an area over a thousand miles long from Pennsylvania to Georgia, and then migrated west, populating a giant part of the country extending out to New Mexico and Texas. The Scottish cultural influence in America is immense, whether through country music, cowboy, or redneck culture, combined with the classic stubbornness and freedom-loving that comes from fighting off the English for centuries. Many of America's greatest warriors and a hugely disproportionate part of the military, with figures like Patton, McClellan, and Andrew Jackson and the like, are of Scots-Irish ancestry. And this is the only demographic besides the English that have a lot of presidents, whether Teddy Roosevelt, Bill Clinton, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, or Andrew Jackson, just to name a couple. However, the Scots-Irish put very little emphasis on hard work and education, meaning the region suffers horrifying poverty. Drug use, fatherlessness, unemployment, and all the other bad statistics are at unimaginable levels in these communities. The book Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance is a very sobering look at this community from the inside. Most of the poorest states in the country are areas that are majority Scots-Irish ancestry. 
The Highland Scottish were a much smaller group during the colonial period, settling in eastern North Carolina, which was an area that was majority Gaelic-speaking into the early 19th century. Scotland in the 18th century experienced a massive technological and social revolution on par with what occurred in Japan, turning a originally poor country into one of the wealthiest and best educated places in the world. When one looks at the poverty of the earliest Scottish immigrants, it's shocking to look at the later ones who immigrated to America largely in northern cities in a steady but low level, and with their better skill set and education, became prosperous and assimilated rapidly. Number 5. German Americans German Americans are probably the second largest group of white Americans, and on census results are the largest group of anyone in America, since so many people that are by all accounts plurality English ancestry mark German. The Germans came over in a long period stretching from the colonial era in the 17th century until the World Wars. They first settled predominantly in Pennsylvania, where the Quaker government encouraged German sects that were similar to the Quakers to settle, becoming about one-third of Pennsylvania's population. Even today, there's a religious fanatical sect of Germans called the Amish in Pennsylvania who speak a dialect of German and don't use modern technology, using horses to travel around rather than cars. Until the middle of the 19th century, most Germans came from the Protestant populations in the southwest of Germany, and after the middle of the 19th century, Germans from everywhere, even Eastern European areas, immigrated to America en masse. Germans were divided among hundreds of states as a chessboard of endless wars and political and religious persecution, with a lot of poverty thrown in, so there were a lot of reasons for Germans to move out. Germans were popular immigrants among the local Americans since they were very hardworking and educated, normally more so than the local Anglo population, and kept their heads down, not starting fights or getting involved in local politics. Wherever the Germans immigrate around the world, whether in Eastern Europe or South America, they always settle on the best land. And this happened in America, where the locus of German America became the rich fields of the American Midwest. Germans became the biggest group in much of the Midwest, dominating the culture in places like Cincinnati, St. Louis, Chicago, Chicago and the like. In areas like Wisconsin or Minnesota, there were whole villages and countrysides of German speakers. However, the Germans went a little bit everywhere, whether going out to the West Coast, especially Oregon, or the American South. Germans had strong communities with schools, fairs, beer halls, newspapers, and the like, enriching everywhere they went, as well as being incredible businessmen, becoming a major driver of the American economy. I mean, just look at companies like Steinway, Hershey, Chrysler, Studebaker, and Rockefeller to name a few. The German Americans assimilated pretty easily into the Anglo society, with them already being industrious, white, Germanic Protestants, but this was driven into overdrive by the world wars, making German culture not cool. As my own personal example, I'm of like 10% German ancestry, but I have basically no German culture since all of my German ancestors married an English American practically when they got off the boat from Europe during the 19th century. Number 6. Irish Americans I'm half Irish, and so this is a cultural group I can speak from personal experience with. Most Irish Americans' ancestors came over in a 20-year period after the Potato Famine. Ireland had become incredibly overpopulated, with the Irish living on tiny plots of land a couple acres, entirely dependent upon the potato. However, a potato blight came by in 1847, resulting in one-third of Ireland's population immigrating, one-third dying, and the rest staying. Ireland was a brutal place. Most Irish were mired in horrifying poverty and hunger under an English domination that verged on a caste system. The English forbade the ethnic Irish from voting, owning land, or attending higher education in their own country, while almost all of the land was owned by English landlords that didn't even live in Ireland. The Irish are probably the most stubborn people of all time, and built a massive sense of cultural unity around fighting the English, and would launch hopeless rebellions on a regular basis. Unlike Germany, which was an economic powerhouse, Ireland was a poor backwater, and so the Irish came to America with basically no education or tradable skills. They also came from a tribal warrior herding culture with little understanding of a work ethic or modern society. The Irish clustered around northeastern cities like New York, Boston, or Philadelphia, working menial jobs living in Irish ghettos. Irish neighborhoods had horrifyingly high crime rates and really bad sanitation. My own ancestors in Jersey City were policemen, which was basically the best job you could get. Even today, Irish Americans are the poorest large group of white Americans. 
The Irish had a strong sense of charisma and cultural identity, which meant they often gained political power and were successful in roles like showmen. Irish political bosses dominated northeastern cities and government jobs like the police or bureaucracy. The Irish had no financial or business skills, and as an example, although my Irish family's been in America since the potato famine, my father was the first person to have a job in the private sector. The Irish integrated into the rest of American society after World War II, moving out into the suburbs, becoming less Catholic and the like. My boomer father would say, I'm the last generation of Irish and you're just an American. However, even today, Irish Americans are by far the group of white Americans with the most ethnic pride, and if we ever need to rebel against a fascist state, I'm sure the rebellion will be spearheaded by the Irish. Number 7. Italian Americans the invention of the steamship meant that oceanic travel became much cheaper, which meant that nations further away from America, that America didn't trade with so much, like South and Eastern Europe, were able to migrate by the million to America at the turn between the 19th to 20th centuries. The biggest of these groups were the Italians, who possibly saw one of the largest diasporas ever in this era, with most immigrating inside Europe or to South America. Like Scotland, Italy is divided into two areas that are totally different, a prosperous and industrial north and a poor and rural south. America had a small prosperous North Italian community, many of whom immigrated to California, and one of which founded the Bank of Italy, which later became the Bank of America. Southern Italy was a poor backward area. It was inhabited by subsistence farmers who were barely getting by with an oppressive nobility on top of them. Unlike the Irish, there was basically no social trust, with people never really trusting or working with people outside their immediate family. This was a society where parents told their children not to play with non-family members in case they couldn't be trusted. Like the Irish, they had very few practicable skills, and so became unskilled laborers clustering in northeastern cities, even more clustering around the greater New York City area. Italian laborers were brought over by contractors who would bring them into neighborhoods and labor groups of people from the same hometowns as them, and most Italian immigrants in fact returned to Italy with savings from America. The Italians lacked the aggression, unity, and charismatic culture of the Irish, but made up with it with work ethic and patience. Although the Italians have a reputation for being mobsters and criminals, that's only really the parasitic mafia elite, while the average Italian was incredibly law-abiding. Americans were often shocked to see how Italians would live in horrible conditions, working long hours, and save practically every cent they earned. Italian Americans had a good business sense, opening up small shops like restaurants, tailors, and the like. However, their main weakness was their distrust of education and strong family collectives. I know the amount of times I'm comparing the Irish to the Italians is egregious, but they're similar and yet different enough being in the same cities at the same times in the same occupations that they're really useful mirrors for the other. If you're leaving an Irish family, your parents will ask you why the fuck you didn't leave earlier. If you're leaving an Italian family, your mother will burst into tears and ask why you're betraying the family. Higher education and working in organizations like the church, government, and the like were viewed with immense suspicion. Whether with the Catholic Church, police, or local government, the Italians worked in institutions dominated by the Irish. Like the Irish who they mixed with a tremendous amount, the Italians pulled themselves out of the northeastern ghettos after World War II. The Italians are now one of the most prosperous groups of white Americans, probably due to their concentration in the wealthy New York area, but also their good business sense. Even today, there's a strong sense of Italian-American pride. Number 8. Jewish Americans The Jews came over at the exact same time as the Italians and settled in the exact same areas, being northeastern cities, especially New York, but the Jews also developed big communities in Los Angeles, Chicago, and Florida. American Jews are heavily from the Ashkenazi Jews of Eastern Europe, with the highest concentration coming from Eastern Poland and modern Western Ukraine, which was an area called the Pale that the Tsar had designated Jews could own land in. This population of Eastern European Jews was completely cut off from modern Western civilization, being completely immersed in religious fundamentalism and Torah law, and their communities called ghettos were often literally worlds unto themselves that were entirely Jewish well, totally surrounded by Gentiles. Eastern Europe was experiencing acute overpopulation at the turn of the 20th century, and the Russian government was also going on a massive assimilation effort, with Europe experiencing a remarkable revitalization of anti-Semitism. Russia's Jews left by the million upon realizing that things would only get worse. Upon arriving in America, they clashed with the previous German Jewish population. 
Unlike Eastern Europe, the German Jews were completely assimilated into Western civilization and were an assimilated part of American society. Looking down upon the recent Eastern European Jewish migrants, who normally came in complete poverty and lived in horrible slums, the story of the Jews upwards from menial labor is pretty similar to that of the Irish and Italians before, but with one major difference, that the Jews had a much stronger emphasis on education. Inside the Jewish community, the social elite were the rabbis, or those who had studied the Torah best, and so Jewish culture had a tradition of education. The Jews generally kept their heads down and then sent their kids to the best schools. After World War II, the importance of education in American society went up tremendously, with the right college being the road to wealth, and the Jews thrived in that world. The Jews became one of the wealthiest groups in America, and the wealthiest large group of white Americans. At the same time, the Jews' lengthy history of being merchants back in Europe helped them a tremendous amount in America's capitalist society. Jews rose to positions of leadership in basically everything, especially Hollywood and business. I think a really funny thing is that the leadership of both the right and the left now in America is heavily Jewish, and to think Jews are only 5% of America's population. The Jews assimilated to American culture, so much so that most American Jews are only loosely actually religiously Jewish. But Jewish American culture is as American as any other subculture. It's just also Jewish. The Jews have thrived in America while at the same time facing more description really than any other group of white Americans. But also in reality, America has been better to the Jews than any other country I can think of in history. This is partially since race is a big binary in America, not religion. But also the Jews have never faced pogroms, legal discrimination, and the like in America. The fact that the Jews are such a big proponent of the social justice movement, styling themselves as the oppressors now in society, must mean something. Number 9. Asian Americans Asian Americans are probably the greatest success story of any group in America. They're the wealthiest race in America, only behind the Jews in income. Asians have immigrated to America in several different batches, with the first being from Japan and China in the late 19th century, in some cases to build railroads. Both Japan and China were experiencing incredible overpopulation that made life difficult while China was experiencing massive political problems. In both cases, both immigrant populations came from certain communities back home. For example, in China, a single town in the province of Guangzhou, providing a majority of immigrants to America. That town became the wealthiest in all of China as the Chinese sent money back to their families. At the end of the 19th century, America had a race panic in which it closed off its borders to Asian immigration entirely for the next 60 years. You had a large Chinese male population in California that died lonely as bachelors. Since they couldn't return to China, they couldn't bring Chinese women over, and interracial marriage was banned. Asians faced horrifying legal discrimination in West Coast states, being banned from owning land, working in many industries, and that doesn't even include just random racism that people and private institutions carried out. Dry cleaners don't exist in China, but the Chinese learned to do dry cleaning since it was one of the few industries open to them. The absolute worst was during World War II when almost all Japanese Americans were interned in concentration camps for the war, with their property taken from them. One of the saddest things about this was that Japanese Americans were actually extremely patriotic, and there was no evidence for sedition or treason on their part. Most of the Asians who came to America did so in total poverty. They shared a lot with the Italians in having a tremendous ability to save money and work long hours in horrible conditions, a good sense for petty business with law-abiding populations that had predatory mafias on top. The greatest strength they had was their strong communities that would support each other, helping raise money for community businesses, making schools and the like, alongside their extremely tight-knit families. Imagine you've got a tight-knit family and you're trying to start a business, knowing that your son or your cousin will work for free at your corner store until you get profits is really what you need. In poor black or brown communities, the merchant classes who run the local shops are normally Asian. However, like the Jews, they came from cultures that prized education. In many Confucian societies like Korea or China, the ruling classes were chosen by those who got the best test results. After World War II, when education became the road to wealth, the Asian community who had saved up money from their dry cleaners, restaurants, or gardening businesses sent their children to college to become CEOs, professors, or movie directors. Most Asian Americans came after the 1960s when the U.S. opened up to non-white immigration and saw a massive flood of immigrants from Korea, China, Southeast Asia, and India. With the exception of 
wealthy immigrants who just immediately entered the American upper class, these immigrants normally followed a similar trajectory to the previous ones, of starting off as menial workers or minor peddlers, then putting their kids through college, having them enter the elite. Indians saw a similar trajectory, except that America pulled from the wealthier educated classes in India, like doctors or coders, thus resulting in an easier transition into American society. Asians, for being 5% of the population, are totally overrepresented among wealthier influential Americans. Number 10. Hispanic Americans Hispanic America is simultaneously the oldest and most recent thing in American history, in that the first European settlements in America were by the Spanish in places like California, Florida, or Texas. However, those were largely the frontiers and edges of the Spanish world, while the massive wave of Hispanic immigrants has taken their place over the last few decades. There have been Hispanics in America since the 16th century, but their numbers were pretty small. In the state of Texas, an area larger than France, there were less than 2,000 Hispanics at the time of America's conquest, and afterwards the U.S. structured their colonization in such a way to make it very easy to dispossess local Hispanic settlers. Even in states on the Mexican border, there was a Hispanic cultural undercurrent, but it was peripheral. There had been a couple different waves of Mexican immigration to America before the middle of the 20th century, but they were largely transitory, as people would come in to work for a bit and then move back, or were forced to move back across the border by American authorities. After 1980 and until 2008, a massive wave of Mexicans immigrated into America across the southern border. This was driven partially by low wages caused by population growth back in Mexico, as well as the disbalances caused by the drug trade, which effectively turned Mexico into a narco state. Mexican immigrants largely worked menial jobs in stuff like restaurants, agriculture, manufacturing, and the like. Due to America's complicated immigration structure, this was largely illegal, with the immigrants living a strange double life where they couldn't rely on the police, healthcare system, or vote. However, the immigrants provided cheap labor that undercut American wages, and so the American elite really didn't do much to stop it. The Mexicans were also willing to work long hours, which first world snowflake Americans weren't. The legal problems gave employers more power over the immigrants anyway. A majority of Hispanics in America are Mexicans, largely from the north and center of the country. Mexicans have become a plurality in the Southwest, with there being more Hispanics than whites in California by over 10 points. There's also a lot of Cubans in Florida, clustering around Miami, which is a wealthy community of upper-class origin that got kicked out by the communists, as well as a large Puerto Rican community based out of New York City that's several times the actual population of Puerto Rico. For nearly 15 years, more Americans have been immigrating to Mexico than Mexicans immigrating to America, but Central Americans are still crossing the border in a large number. Interestingly enough, you don't see income ranges among Hispanics that have much to do with race. For example, darker-skinned Mexicans or Dominicans are wealthier than the mostly white Puerto Ricans. Much to the shock of isolationists, Hispanics have assimilated at a remarkably fast speed in the rest of American society. They've moved up the economic totem pole, now being wealthier than black people, and even along the Mexican border assimilate very fast into American culture. Even in places along the Mexican border, with cities with Spanish names like San Diego or Laredo, the problem that Hispanic parents are worried about is their kids not knowing Spanish and losing their Mexican culture, not them not learning English and becoming American enough. The fact that we're seeing Hispanics vote for conservative candidates at higher and higher rates suggests something. At the same time, the fact that that both Hispanics and Asians marry out of their ethnicities or race at over 40% every generation suggests assimilation is complete. What a faultist, and thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for additional content. Or alternatively, check out my Pillar, Pearl, or Patreon. As always, thanks so much for watching, stay tuned for future videos, and have a great day.